but I also work at um, the Otto von Goerke University in Magdeburg, which is where I do, let's say, the, the computer science side of my work um, mainly. And so this uh, today we'll be talking mostly about computer science related rather than social science related. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Well, um, we have chemical ontologies and one uh, example of a chemical ontology is KEBI. Um, it uh, was developed to solve the problem of linking up chemical structural information, such as you know, the, the atoms and the bonds um, of chemicals with names such as uh, caffeine, which is a trivial or common name for a chemical rather than a systematic name, which looks something somewhat more unpronounceable. And all sorts of other information, especially annotations in biological databases and information about what these chemicals do. And this kind of uh, connection between um, what chemicals look like and how they are structured, what they are named and what they do in different, for example, biological contexts is just enormously useful to then be able to sort of develop uh, algorithms which try to answer questions or to interpret text automatically and so on. So it's a hugely um, valuable knowledge resource. And um, what this looks like in practice when we say chemical ontology means you have a classification. So you're, each chemical has some or other parents and the parents have parents and the so on all the way up to the root of the chemical ontology. And um, there can be other relationships such as how parthood has parts. So uh, you also have other relationships such as functional parent. I won't go into the details of, of these, they're, um, that how they're used in KEBI, but um, just important to note that this kind of large comprehensive systematic classification of all that's known about um, chemicals in a way that can be understood both by humans and by uh, machines as, as far as possible. And these are linked then with annotations, which are kind of text encodings of other useful information, such as different ways of formatting the chemical structure, including the smile string, which is a kind of line notation or linear representation of the chemical structure. So KEBI is a manually maintained ontology. And what that means is that there are really people who are trained chemists who know chemistry very well, whose job it is to add things to KEBI, to, to sit down and check, is this name correct? Is this chemical structure correct? Do these fit together? What's the best parent for this or that uh, molecule that's been added to the ontology. And this means that uh, the ontology has a high quality compared to um, resources which do exist, um, which are completely automatically assembled, usually purely automatically assembled resources include errors and uh, problems and typos, the equivalent of typos in, in a chemical ontology context. Um, and all of these can be filtered out by the trained and careful curation from humans who know what they're doing. So this makes uh, an ontology such as KEBI more valuable than, than, than a resource which is purely automatically assembled. But it also means that the growth in terms of the number of entities in the ontology is going to be slow. It's going to be as slow as it sort of takes a human to to do this work, this knowledge work. So this plot here shows you this number of entities, the number of uh, molecules or classes of molecules that were in KEBI over the history of all the time that KEBI has been uh, around for, which is more than 10 or possibly by now 15 years. And um, how it, you can see it's mostly grows kind of linearly and you could uh, the slope at any moment in time more or less relates to the number of curators that they were at that time working full time on, on the KEBI resource. So it's sort of slowed down in recent years and that was because there were fewer curators working there and that may change again in the future depending on, on funding and other constraints. So um, there's a scalability challenge and this is especially uh, notable in the context of the chemistry domain where 
you know, what's informally often referred to as chemical space is known to be kind of huge. So this, um, this is the size of different resources in chemistry, which are collecting chemical structural information. And um, well, PubChem is a very well known database of chemical structures, which is uh, automatically assembled. And it includes um, a, more than a hundred million um, chemical structures, uniquely individual chemical structures. And um, the GDB is a kind of predicted uh, chemical structure resource, which uh, includes known, but also um, not known chemicals. But I think all estimates of uh, which chemicals may or may not exist far exceed any that we have in, in, in our databases. And therefore, the 500 and something thousand, uh, sorry, 50 something thousand chemicals that actually are in KEBI at the moment in the, in the fully curated branch or part of KEBI, it seems very small in comparison. So this is a, a log scale here to, to be able to show. So the problem is that we have a very useful resource serving a very um, important purpose, but it's perennially kind of too small. Um, and one opportunity which exists and has been, has been harnessed in various ways to, to deal with this challenge is to use automated approaches to extend chemical ontologies while not building the whole ontology automatically because that would then reduce the quality of the resource, but simply to extend. So to take the classes that are there and um, add new members where it can be recognized unambiguously that that structure belongs to that class. So here you see, for example, an illustration of various uh, chemical aspects of a chemical structure, which by virtue of the way that they, their features that they have indicate that this chemical should belong to the indicated classes. So for example, the carboxy group over here means that this chemical should be classified as a carboxylic acid. And in fact, there are tools which do this kind of um, automatic extension and the most well-known and widely used one is called classifier. If you say that very quickly, it sounds like classifier, which is uh, then <laughs> nobody knows exactly how to spell it, but uh, why I'm emphasizing the classy fire, like chemical class and then fire. Um, and this tool is based on rules around these groups, these kind of groups, which you find in the chemical structures. So there's a large collection of about 9,000 or so rules. And um, these rules are then matched to chemical structures and based on that, a prediction for which chemical classes um, the molecule should be classified under is, is produced. And, and this is widely, this tool is widely used now. And it is in fact also used in the maintenance of KEBI when there, when KEBI is loading a collection of, of compounds for which it does not uh, yet have curation capacity. So things go into a kind of a pipeline where they will be curated but the first placement is given by this tool classifier. So the challenge with rule-based approaches is that you have to manually maintain the rules. And you, if you add new classes to the ontology, you have to change your, your software, which does the, this prediction. So itself, it is a kind of a not as scalable approach as you might imagine that a system based on learning might be. So a research question which we, um, myself and colleagues at the, at the University in Magdeburg uh, try to answer is whether we could use machine learning. So modern machine learning approaches, uh, which are being put to great effect in many problems, to solve many problems in the life sciences. Could we use machine learning to automatically classify a compound or a structured chemical entity into the ontology. So um, this, actually this question um, was one that we looked at more than 10 years ago with the previous kind of class of machine learning approaches. And at that time, we found that 
this didn't work so well, but maybe uh, we gave up too soon and didn't fully and systematically explore the reasons for what was or wasn't working. So um, what we decided to do this time was to be very systematic about it, to try different learning approaches and compare them and to um, sort of map out the, the landscape of how well the different approaches could perform in addressing this task. So we took a sample of what are now called classical machine learning approaches, such as regression, decision tree learning, um, discriminant analysis, and, and, and so on. And we also tried a more modern deep learning approach. Uh, in fact, we used a long short-term memory network in this type of network. What's important about it is that it uh, not only can account for sequences in the input, but also for sort of longer dependencies between input tokens so that you can get some idea of an overall structure from a linear input. And just something to note that these different approaches require in a way different data formatting to sort of go into them. So we use the chemical fingerprints for as input for the classical approaches because there we needed a fixed length kind of numeric input in order to, to use these machine learning approaches. But for our deep learning implementation, we used the SMILES, which is the structural representation of the molecule, which may have a variable length, depending how big the molecule is. And this means that when we're comparing the outcomes, we're not really comparing like with like, but uh, I'll, I'll, just to keep this in mind, and I'll talk more about this as we go through. So the first challenge that we had to solve in applying machine learning to this problem is that the way that the ontology, in particular KEBI, although it would be true for many bio-ontologies, the way that the ontology is shaped, is literally structured and organized, uh, makes it a very challenging data structure to, to use machine learning for. So, this kind of messy, messy illustration here of the uh, parents of the caffeine in the ontology comes from the Kebi website itself. And what you can see is that each class may have multiple parents and those parents may themselves have multiple parents so that you end up with this kind of diamond shape. So the chemical knowledge uh, or chemical ontology is diamond shaped because at the middle level, you have kind of generic uh, classes of chemicals such as polycyclic, organic, um, nitrogen containing, and so on. So these kind of more generic uh, classes have many, many, many members. And down at the lower levels, you have more specific classes, which then have fewer members. And uh, as you get up to the top, everything converges on a common route. So what you have here is a multi-class uh, prediction problem because each chemical has many different classes to which it belongs, which is polyhierarchical. So you can't use a kind of a tree-based structure to make the prediction more efficient. It's sparse in the sense that any one molecule, so there are thousands of classes in the ontology, but any one molecule will belong to only relatively few of those. And it's unbalanced in the sense that the different classes have radically different members. So here is just for an illustration of what this looks like. Here are uh, the numbers from Kebi for the number of classes within the ontology that have that many members. So members is defined here as a leaf level uh, entry with a structure. So what it means is that it doesn't have any children in the ontology and it has an annotated chemical structure and we call that a member. Just to have some, in Kebi there are just classes, everything is a class, whether it has a structure or not, and everything can have, can have children, but um, just for convenience we, we needed to make a distinction between classes that we would predict and classes that we would use as, as input, so we, we call the, the leaves which have structures members. And if you start with just 10 members, you see that you have just a bit over 2,500 classes that have 10 members uh, each. So <clears throat> that means that even though the ontology as a whole has um, 
more than 50,000 entries in it, your substantial classes, if having 10 different chemicals belonging to you makes you substantial, is only in the region of 2,500. But most multi-class machine learning classification problems deal with around 10 or 100 at most different uh, classes. So you predicting 2,500 different classes with machine learning is just not really where we're at yet. So if you go up in terms of numbers of members, you quickly see that the number of classes you need to predict falls down until you get to the, you take 500 members, you only have around 300 classes that you need to predict. But to have 500 members, you're talking about these very general classes in the ontology. And these are not the ones that you're really interested in if you're trying to do chemical classification. So the challenge is finding the, the optimum here the, in terms of specificity of class, but where you can achieve uh, making a sensible predictions. So what we did is we used um, subsampling, so selecting members from classes, to generate uh, learning-ready data sets of members on the one hand with structures and classes that they belong to in a way that uh, aimed to avoid overlaps. So even though, in fact, the classes overlap, we tried to avoid for making the learning task uh, more feasible by the selection process. So what this meant is we started with the cl classes that had a certain number of members and we took different sizes in order to probe the, the, the overall uh, problem space kind of systematically. And then we selected members for classes uniquely. So once a member had been selected for one class, even if it belonged to another class, we didn't select it for, for that other class until so we reached the number of classes. And this um, selection kind of pans out at around uh, 500 by 200 or 200 by 500. You can't do more than that uniquely with the existing heavy data set. So we then took this regularized data sets of different sizes and tried different machine learning approaches on them. And the, then we get our results. And the first uh, result that was very evident was that on average, performance decreases with the size of uh, the problem, with the size of the sampled subontology. So we would expect this for number of classes. So if we're trying to predict 400 classes, we would expect lower performance than if we were trying to predict 50 classes. But what was surprising as well was that um, performance also decreases with number of members. So here the solid lines are for predictions where the number of, we had 25 members per class. So there it's 500 by 25. And uh, here we have 500 members, 200 members, 100 members and so on. So you can see that the performance decreases. And this was surprising for us, but um, once we thought about it, we realized that what was going on was most likely just an artifact of the fact that if you have selected more members, then it means that you have had to choose because we're sampling from uh, Kebi, which is a finite data set. So you ha we had to cho have chosen broader classes and the broader classes would then have more semantic overlap and therefore uh, be harder to distinguish with the machine learning. So the LSTM was the deep learning approach that we used. And you can see that in contrast to the others, which the classical approaches, which have similar patterns, the LSTM does not, uh, the performance does not decrease um, so much with the size of the problem. So, and this is very noticeable if you look at the difference between the 100 classes performances and the 500 classes performance in both cases with 100 members. What you see is that while uh, simple regression is the best performing in the smaller problem set, uh, the LSTM, the, the deep learning network 
is dramatically the best performing when you get to larger numbers of classes. And this is, I think, um, a very important sort of indication of the capabilities of these types of networks compared to the other machine learning approaches for this problem. And we took this as a, a very exciting result. Um, one other observation which we found was that the while the classical approaches always predict classes given a input molecule, the LSTM um, in some cases makes no class prediction at all. So this is, um, I think related in a way to the problem of generalizability of, of deep learning networks where they, they learn certain things to make certain predictions based on features in the input. Uh, but if the input looks a bit too different from what they saw in their training, then they just think, oh, well, I, I don't recognize this and, and don't make. So what you see here is that for some molecules, there were uh, literally no, no predictions at all. And um, most of the molecules, when it made predictions, they were correct. So I think this is one important proviso and one thing which makes us think that the, the way forward will involve a balance of more than one approach. Another thing which makes us think that the, the way forward will involve a balance of more than one approach is that we observe that different learning algorithms gave um, not always fully overlapping best performing classes. So if you look at the classes for which the performance was really good from the different uh, algorithms, and these are different, again, different problem sizes. So we could not use the LSTM on the 25 members problem size because there was not enough data for it to learn from. But then it uh, outperforms in terms of number of best performing classes when we, when we do use it. But um, even when the LSTM outperforms the others, some classes are better predicted by other approaches. So we see the, there, there is potential value in using more than one learning algorithm to solve this problem together. Some other observations that we made from these experiments, the classical learning approaches gave very, very poor performance on more general classes. I think we would expect this. I think that the, the predicting the more general classes, if you've got some kind of, if you imagine some sort of space which you're trying to separate using classical approaches, this uh, will never work very well. Um, we also saw that the classical approaches gave very poor performance on some specific classes of chemical entities. So here we see salts and cations. And I think here the problem is just that the information which distinguishes these classes was not present in the fingerprint that we used for input. Bearing in mind that for the classical approaches, we had to generate first a chemical fingerprint before passing it to the learning exercise. Now, when we look at the worst performing um, classes for the LSTM, which we can look at separately, we saw that interestingly, this was uh, completely dominated by chemicals which had aromatic ring structures. So <laughs> this was kind of an interesting finding and, and, and caused us to sit back and think, what was it about the aromatic ring structures that was causing the LSTM trouble? And uh, although we're still not entirely sure, our hypotheses are around the um, encoding of aromaticity in the smile string. And maybe this is not optimal for learning purposes the way it's done at the moment. So um, one question which we had was how well our LSTM or this learning approach compared to the state of the art, which is this classifier rule, rules based tool, which also predicts uh, for novel chemicals, it also predicts um, class membership. So here, um, it's not trivial to make this comparison because, well, for various reasons, but um, one reason is that these tools don't predict just one class, uh, but many. 
And in fact, classifier predicts lots and lots of classes for, for each sort of a mean of eight, I think it was, classes for each input molecule. And you see that asserted parents, the actual classes that a molecule is classified under in Kebi is more like around one or two, I think maybe two point something was the mean. And the LSTM predictions track the Kebi because we use it as the, as the input. So these have quite different profile of predictions. So we can't compare like with like. Another challenge was that in preparing the training data because we needed to select uh, classes which did include a certain number of members, we don't just give the directly asserted parents, but rather sometimes selecting members for a class a bit further away in the hierarchy. So you see here our training data has classes uh, which are directly asserted parents, but also the parents of the parents, and sometimes a bit more. And this means that we're training with non-direct parents as well as direct parents. We're not, uh, LSTM can't learn something more direct than what it, it has been trained with. So uh, anyway, then nevertheless, I think it's, it's interesting to do this comparison. So something else to bear in mind about the comparison is that Classifier uses its own chemical ontology, which is mapped to Kebi, so we can get out the Kebi classes but not exactly. So sometimes the mapping is um, lossy in the sense that the classifier class is more specific than the Kebi class that it maps to. And um, another point is that classifier is already used in Kebi maintenance, but it was not possible to, to totally separate that in our training set. So with all those provisos, we, we can then say that what we observed was that classifier's best prediction was still outperforming our learned predictions, but classifier's worst prediction was performing worse, and our predictions were in the middle, basically between these. So a good contender, and um, I think uh, in general, uh, robust performance for this type of approach, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that the benefits are that it can potentially be used quite dynamically and without updating any manual rules whatsoever. So just to recap where we're at at the moment, the uh, deep learning approaches, as well as classical machine learning approaches can give ontology class predictions for chemicals. Um, different approaches have different advantages and disadvantages. The best performing is the LSTM, but this has uh, various limitations. And one of the limitations is that it's not explainable. So what we did then was we asked whether we could get any uh, explainability out of a more modern transformer-based architecture. So transformers offer this concept of attention and the attention tracks bits of the input signal that were used in the classification. So it can give uh, but perhaps um, excitingly some insights which curators can then use to sort of say is the model doing the right thing or not. So Roberta is a um, transformer based uh, network architecture which is then uh, used with two steps a kind of pre training step which teaches the language in this case smiles. And then a final training step which teaches the task in this case ontology prediction. Same as before, we used the same data set as before. Uh, what we observed was that we got somewhat significantly better performance from Roberta, not, not a total dramatic sea change, but quite uh, sig uh, a significant shift sort of towards higher F1 scores and reduced um, absent predictions from this architecture, just a different learning model. And I think that's that's good, that's promising. Um, we didn't change the data set at all. We would potentially in future work have improvements we could make just you know, by doing the training better. But in this case, we, we didn't try to, to do that. And then we, we had the opportunity to inspect the attention weights and ask, you know, could this help understand what the model is doing? 
So just to know what this data looks like, you have uh, several layers. In our case, we use six layers. And you have several different attention heads. In our case, we use 12 attention heads. And for a particular input token, you then get different um, attentions in these layers and across these heads. And you can see that the patterns look quite different for these different sort of input tokens. And you may say that, for example, uh, attention to an oxygen atom is quite particular, while to carbon, it's very diffuse and, and, and has lots of different meanings. Um, and there's a whole science of interpreting these, these attention weights, which I think is truly fascinating. But um, of course, what it also means is that if you take a kind of average of these weights for a particular input sequence, so here you have the sort of tokenized version of an input smile string, and you have some summation of the weights which have been uh, given to that particular part of the input smile string. And then you can uh, see that for what the model predicted, in this case, organobromine, when, in making that prediction, it was giving the most importance to these parts of the input. And as illustrated there, it kind of tracks what you would expect because it's making a classification of the organobromine and it's looking at the bone. So another example, making a classification of barbiturates and paying attention to the structure which represents a barbituric acid ring. So uh, it, this is, I think, quite nice because it shows that this kind of uh, attentions that are available within this model would potentially be able to be informative and useful for people looking at the output of this model and thinking, does this make sense? So in conclusion then, um, what, we, what we have found that indeed um, deep learning provides a promising direction for automated ontology extension. In domains with structured objects in particular, we looked at chemistry, but this would work for any ontology which had some kind of structure from which you can learn. There were specific challenges um, such as not being able to use very small classes and having a kind of boundary of generalizability uh, beyond which the model won't make predictions. And therefore, we envision that the way to solve this problem more comprehensively would be to sort of have some kind of ensemble approach where if you didn't get a prediction from your uh, model, you could then use a down the line, a different uh, one of the classical approaches, which always give a prediction. And, and then you're guaranteed to get a prediction. Uh, we would like to explore different ways of handling the input, such as there's a different representation of smiles, which does handle ring encodings uh, differently in order to optimize processing in this kind of, of learning network, and graph neural networks, which you provide the, the, the structure as a graph and the network itself learns um, how to best to encode the graph in order to support the learning task. And another direction which we're still uh, pursuing is how to use the kind of interesting axioms from the ontology, such as which classes should always be disjoint in order to uh, improve the prediction performance. So with that, I stop and thank my co-authors at the University of Magdeburg for uh, their hard work. <laughs> And um, thank you for listening.